Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Civil Engineering Alumni Session today. So today we are very glad to invite engineer Emily Tan to give us a talk about win-win solution in transportation planning. I think that's a topic everyone will be very interested. Uh, so please let me first introduce uh, Ms. Emily Tan first. Uh, Emily Tang is a Managing Director of TSM Consultancy, a Singapore-based uh, traffic and transportation consultancy company uh, of more than 20 years. Recently, she was a consultant with the World Bank, uh, working on the assignment under the Bloomingberg Initiative for Global Road Safety. She was previously uh, stationed in UK and Australia besides setting up TSM in Singapore. She also served the Singapore community as an appointed town councillor from 20, uh, 2013 to 2017, and a district councillor uh, at the Northeast Community Development Council from uh, 2011 to 2014. She was also serving in the Citizen uh, Consultative com Committee from 2012 and 2016. She was a board member with the Professional Engineers Board and the Board of Architects from 2018 to 2020. She is currently a board member of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport as well as the president of the Association of Women in Construction at Singapore. So today, uh, Ms. Emily Tan will talk about the win-win solution in transportation planning. Uh, she will talk about how transportation planning has helped to provide better mobility and accessibility design in the spaces that we live and work and play. So let's welcome engineer uh, Emily Tan. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel to raise your hand in Zoom or type your question in the chat box. So uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the seminar. Okay. Welcome, uh, Ms. Emily Tan. Okay, so we can see your screen now. Okay, all right, just got myself unmute. Um, so you can actually see the um, PowerPoint slides, right? On the slideshow? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, that's good. Uh, so uh, anyway, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, those who are all tuned in, um, thank you very much, uh, NUS, for inviting me for this sharing session. So uh, maybe before I uh, go on with this lecture, just a bit of introduction, I wear several hats. Um, but today I'd like to highlight um, the Association of Women in Construction because that's where that's the newest uh, association that we have. And uh, it's about one and a half years now. Um, we basically want to bring together all the different areas within the built environment. So instead of operating in silos, we bring the whole built environment industry together. And this membership, although it's called the uh, Association of Women in Construction, a lot of people have asked me, um, are men allowed to join? Yes, they are all allowed to join. It's actually gender neutral in the sense that the, um, our members are both male and female. And uh, we do actually have a, a, a good number of male members as well. So we count, so this one and a half year old um, uh, association, right? We have about uh, 30 individual members as well as uh, 30 corporate members. And, um, and uh, um, we have a good mix from uh, developers to contractors, consultants, basically entire built environment and even suppliers as well. And um, for the individual members, um, we have uh, people from the private sector as well as the public sector. So it's quite, a very, it's quite a good mix, so it's very good for networking as well, especially for those who are looking for jobs. Yeah, so you can uh, 
um, network with uh, all of them. So, and uh, because they're all corporate members, so activities are actually also um, joined by both the men and the, uh, and the women as well. So just a little bit about my company, uh, TSM. So we have been around for 23 years exactly this year. It was uh, founded by myself uh, and, um, and uh, we do only traffic and transportation and we are specialist uh, transportation consultants. And uh, our project, even though we are specialists, we actually um, deal with, uh, or rather we have worked with many, many projects um, from uh, different types of development usage, from commercial, industrial, residential, retail, uh, you name it, we have it, educational institutions, uh, and even tourist attractions as well. So, and uh, our, our clients are different and very varied. We have public sector clients, private sector clients, both big and small, from MNCs to you know, government bodies, uh, statutory boards, um, and uh, uh, private developers as well. So very varied kind of things because we, uh, anything, anybody who has a, uh, traffic issues, they, they, will, they will kind of need us. And um, usually um, we are not so known to people unless they suddenly need to um, encounter some traffic issues and they, they will, somehow or other they'll be able to look, uh, find us. So, okay, so today I will, I will get on to the actual uh, uh, lecture today. So my lecture title is Win-Win Solutions of the uh, um, Transportation. Um, let me see, can I actually... Okay, so, uh, so the, I'll use four case studies to, to illustrate what is, uh, what is the transportation planning and how we can introduce transportation planning solutions in the different types of projects. Sorry, Emily. Yes. Sorry, uh, where you still see it's not in full screen. Oh, it's still not in full screen. Right. Mm -hmm. We saw your clip full screen, but it just doesn't show us a full screen. Yeah. yeah, okay. Let me just try and get this onto full screen. Uh, I guess I've got to share a different uh, screen or something, right? Right. If you are using true screen, that might be the problem. Okay. Can you see now? Ah, uh, yes, great. Okay, that's good. All right. All right, so, uh, okay, I start again. So we're gonna use the four case studies um, to illustrate uh, the transportation planning solutions. So the first one is Capital Spring, um, that is right, right in the middle of the city. And then we have a Sinkang Grand, which is a transit-oriented development that is in the suburbs. Then we also will, will use the uh, Thompson East Coast Line, which you all know that it is uh, under construction. And uh, this one, we'll use it to show you uh, 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 under construction, what it can be done, some solutions. And we also look at the um, issue bus interchange and that we use it for illustration for um, road safety audits. So the first case study, which is the Capital Spring, I have this project lorry, that's, that's, that's the code name for the uh, project itself, yeah. So this is a redevelopment of the Market Street car park and it's a mixed-use development consisting of offices, service, service apartments, retail and F&B outlets and also, um, interestingly, a hawker centre as well. So, and this is right in the middle of the, of the, um, of the uh, CBD. Yeah. 
Okay, so this this is a site, and this used to be occupied by a market street, and it's just a um, car park installation. So they want to tear it down and then demolish it and then redevelop it into a mixed use development. So this this project has been ongoing. You see it construct it being constructed uh, right now in the CBD. But uh, we started work way back about six or um, six or seven years ago, and in that time, um, the walking and cycling and uh, is not so uh, popular as yet. And we LTA used this project and we piloted the walking and cycling plan. So as you can see, right, um, um, this this map itself here is actually very detailed. Um, all the legend is here, so they have we actually identify where are the bus stops, where are the taxi bays. So if you look at all these tiny ones, they are the taxi bays. We also identify where are the MRT stations. So there are three MRT stations in and around here. Um, we have the Clark Key Station, Teluk Ayi Station, as well as the Raffles Place MRT Station. So we actually go down right down to the detail of where where are the openings of the uh, develop um, the, the, the MRT stations. So we then map out the different routes from the stations to the development itself. And we have we have different entrances for the uh, different users, office, office, be it office, service, uh, or the service apartment. So in very detailed, we actually map it out and see where are the de um, desire lines for the pedestrians. This is just another illustration of where the hawker center is and it comes into the development. And these are the cycling routes. So LTA has plans to develop the cycle path and we work together with LTA as, as well as the developer and we identify um, on the map where are the routes coming into the development for the cycling. This is to make it more cycle friendly and more sustainable form of transport. So what are some of the transportation solutions? First and foremost, there's the expansion of the Market Street. So Market Street used to be a uh, one-way one way, uh, one way street, right? From Church Street and then you go down to Trulia Street. So in part and parcel of this development, the, there was this, there was an, um, the proposal was to pedestrianize Market Street and also part of Malacca Street. Hence, this road needs to be close off to traffic and it's um, expunged. In fact, it's already expunged now, but it is occupied by the construction at this point in time. And later on, when this entire development is uh, uh, constructed and uh, in operation, this whole place would be pedestrianized. And this is integrated together with the development. So it'll be a nice uh, community space uh, over here. And Philip Street over here, this is a two-way street. Okay, before I go on to Philip Street, we also had to, um, we only expunged half of Market Street. Hence, the, the other half of the, of the Market Street will need to be converted to a two-way road so that vehicles can still go in and out. And this is the drop-off area in the future. Right. And Philip Street, which is currently one way going down this way, it will be converted to a two-way street. And in order to do that, um, currently there are on-street parking at Great and uh, on, on the street on both sides of Philip Street. So all the parking, parking lots would be taken away and make space for another lane. And on top of that, there will also be cycling path uh, along the Philip Street. There's also cycling, and because um, you need some connectivity, so the cycling paths are also planned along Church Street as well as Julia Street. Right. So these are just some of the transportation tools used. In order to do all of that, we have to convince LTA that uh, this project is uh, will not um, affect the uh, road traffic unnecessarily or cause um, delays to the other road users. 
So we need to study how the traffic comes about or how the traffic uh, travels within the CBD. So we use the origin destination study. So we did a survey. So that is to collect the travel information and to determine and to forecast what would be the future traffic patterns um, once the market street is uh, partially closed. So we, while doing this, we had about 50 uh, origin destinations locations within the CBD. And um, we, we actually you had about 50, uh, every, every location had about one person. And we recorded the license plate numbers and the time, uh, what time and the time that we see them. So it's, it's actually a very tedious task to do that, right? Of course, there are now technology to uh, use, use uh, to do the origin destination survey, but practically, unfortunately, um, when we're doing projects, we are unable to put all these uh, things because there are other methods like using mobile phone data um, or, or that number plate survey. But if you think about it, if you need to do number plate survey, you will have a whole big cordon here. Um, it'll be a very, very expensive task. So in the end, we have to weigh between all the uh, um, technology, good, but practical, practically on the, uh, uh, this, these, all these costs are actually taken up by the developer. Hence, uh, every cent counts for them. So that's why in the end, uh, we have to still use, go back to manual sometimes. All right. So I just want to show you the uh, micro simulation. Uh, right. So this is a micro simulation. So with all the data that is collected, then we feed this into a model then, and it's called micro simulation modeling and it's a VSIM model. So we built this entire model, uh, entire road network, including the uh, uh, ingress, egress of the development uh, into the model. And then we input all the traffic counts as well as the origin destination of the different uh, vehicles. Uh, so we made made the distribution. So all these all these we have to do, in, and this actually goes down all the way to the individual, and we'll be able to look at what is the individual uh, the delay either individually for each vehicle, what is the highest delay, or as a network itself. So this is just this is before, and usually we use uh, we use a cali we need the existing mod existing network and uh, to calibrate the uh, model itself. Okay. So, and this one is the one that is after the closure, after the road closure. So if you look at here, we even um, model pedestrian crossing, right? So this is after the, the uh, closure. And you will see that they'll be slightly different. So this is again Phillip Street is modeled as a two-way, and then this is a, a Julia Street. Yeah. And this goes into the development itself, the proposed development into the car park area. And this area over here, that's the pick up and drop off area. So we model it to details. Uh, the very fine details of it. And we even have the Philip uh, Trulia Street, uh, the pedestrian crossing over here. And if you can see here, uh, that's, that was the taxi stand and this is the pick up and drop off area. So these are the details that we go to in order to get the end result of it. So before we can, after we convince LTA that, okay, that can be done, then we need also, so this is, this is, this project, right, is nearly like the whole life cycle of it from, from first the design planning all the way to construction and then uh, to implementation as well. So for this one, you will see that uh, we need to do the, in order to close it, we need to uh, temporarily close it first so that it can, uh, it can be, works can be done here. So in order to do that, right, it was quite a massive exercise because uh, um, we have to inform the public as well. So quite a, a lot of uh, uh, 
communication needed to be done to the stakeholders in and around the area. And then after that, there'll be publications in the newspaper to tell people that uh, the road will be closed from when and uh, uh, what are the alternative routes. So, this, so besides all the uh, uh, micro simulation, which you have just seen, we also do traffic diversion plans. So these are engineering plans and it's to scale and all the signages needs to be also designed for, right? And then we also look at what is the rerouting plan and these are part and parcel of the communication to the public and the stakeholders uh, in and around the area. So we look at, we'll see that, okay, this needs to be pedestrianized and then we look at um, why, why we still need to keep partially the market street open because actually there's a access over here to the adjacent development. So we cannot just cut it off itself. Um, we did not pedestrianize the entire Malacca Street because there's still um, access to the uh, other developments. So we have to take into consideration many, many factors and we have to go onto the ground to study the site and also even sometimes talk to the stakeholders. All right, so that's, that's, that's the whole life cycle of the previous project. Um, it is under construction now and very soon it, was, it, will, it would be in operation, yeah, the actual development itself. So now I move on to the second study, which is the uh, Sengkang Mall. Um, again, this is a uh, mixed development, but this mixed development is slightly smaller, I mean smaller, um, uh, smaller scale in that sense to, to the one in the city, but it's a, it's a transit oriented development because it has an integrated bus interchange and an existing MRT station within the entire development. So this is again under construction. Um, a lot of our projects, we are always at the forefront of it. And uh, so, um, a lot of the projects that we work on, um, we are unable to even divulge because uh, it takes a few years before the confidentiality is lifted, right? So usually the ones that you see being constructed, then we can talk about it. So again, this is the, this is the site itself. If um, I guess all of you would know it, know the place quite well that, because uh, it's in Kang. And um, so there's a residential, residential development, um, integrated community and transport hub. And um, if you look at this picture on your right hand side, we even have a community, community plaza here. Um, because this is in the heartlands, so um, they want to cater to the um, the residents in and around the area, right? And uh, there's an MRT station that is nearby here as well, okay? So we look at the accessibility study. So it is, in the recent years, LTA is quite big about this uh, accessibility study for pedestrians, for cyclists. So that is why um, nearly every project that is commercial related, uh, we do have this accessibility study, be it a walking cycling plan or, or, or just a accessibility study itself, looking at all types of uh, uh, um, uh, accessibility to the development. So we go down to looking at where is the residential development, uh, residential access, uh, where is the bus interchange access, emergency access, the commercial access itself. Uh, then we even have a true block link. So this, this would mean that um, pedestrians would be able to walk through this 24 by seven. And there's a pick up and drop off point. So we then look at the connectivity to the MRT station as well as the bus interchange. So we look down to the detail of how people may walk or uh, following some desire lines, uh, where are the origin and the destination, be it from the residential developments on the left hand side, they want to cross over to this development uh, to take a bus or to the MRT station. So it's all surrounded. And you also have the bus interchange, uh, um, access, uh, ingress and egress over here. So all these are the key transportation uh, network and uh, where are the bicycle, bicycle lots? We even place bicycle lots for them. Easy accessibility to the station is usually very nearby the station as well as the bus interchange. 
So that's really for the last mile uh, activities. So again, this is similar to the one that we saw for uh, the other project, uh, Project Glory in the city. Um, so we look at the bus stops and all that. So this is mainly to look at the uh, accessibility and the uh, pedestrian desire lines. So just now you saw the micro simulation for vehicle, vehicles. So this one, you will see the micro simulation for pedestrians. So we model the entire uh, concourse of the bus interchange. And this one is to illustrate that there's actually a door and this is the panel for the door because sliding doors uh, need to have a panel to hold it up. Um, then we even look at um, things like um, over here, the queuing. So we built this exactly to what is going to be constructed on site. Uh, where's the queuing area? These are the side doors to it. And of course, you don't see the bus, but why people are crowding here? That's because they are queuing to get up onto the bus, right? So these are all the boarding berths of the bus interchange. Right? And you'll see that they are walking here and they are walking to different uh, destinations, be it to the residential going home or to the other, to the MRT station. So this goes to the MRT station itself. Right, so th these are some of the minute details of what we can do for the, uh, for the uh, micro simulation. And for this kind of thing, we can then see where are the pinch points, where are the bottlenecks uh, of, the of the design. And we would then be able to uh, advise the architects or the designer, where should we put the staircases, escalators, or should we uh, not have uh, uh, extra staircases or, or things like that. So all the different types of pedestrian um, facilities. So in this part of it, right, um, what are the, some of the solutions that we had um, looking at it? So we, we signalized the crossing at the compass bill so that pedestrians can cross over easily to the development, to the TOD. Then we also signalize the bus interchange access because it's always safer to have such to have it signalized so that um, the pedestrians and the uh, and the bus coming in and out of the bus interchange do not have a conflict and they have a clear uh, clear clear way you know uh, clear right of way and of course we have the true block lane the, to take care of the uh, commuters uh, to take care of the pedestrians. Then we also have the end of trip facilities. So these are all part and parcel of the transportation planning uh, facilities that we can uh, recommend to the developments. So the next one we look at is a uh, um, uh, um, is a traffic impact assessment. Why? We, how we actually help the contractor make their construction easier by removing a pedestrian overhead bridge across a road. And for this case, it's across Marine Parade Road. This is during construction. And this, this, this particular solution is actually just like, uh, this, this project is stretches over seven to eight years. Uh, but with the COVID, it's probably about nine years now. And this is probably like 1% of our work in this entire project. So this is like, uh, so this is like um, uh, something that we actually do and we follow the contractor through and help them throughout uh, as and when they is needed. So for this, in order for them to construct it safely, construct whatever they want to construct the stations, they wanted to take down the pedestrian overhead bridge and then introduce it at grid pedestrian crossing along Marine Parade Road. And if, with, with the introduction of our at grid signalized pedestrian crossing, of course, the LTA would be very concerned with uh, queue, queuing on the road because it's, it's an additional stop for the drivers. So you can see over here, so this is a, a Marine Parade Road, um, all right, and, and, and uh, this is the pedestrian overhead bridge that they wanted to take it down, which is over here. So, and these are two junctions that are nearest to it and we are introducing and yet an, another signalized uh, junction for the drivers. 
So you can understand now why LTA would be very concerned with that. So if you look at this, it's rather close. It's about 200 meters from the, from the, uh, from the one of the junctions and only 100 plus 120 uh, meters from the, the other junction. So it's right smack, well, it's not exactly smack in the middle, but it's actually uh, somewhere in the middle there. But at least, at least um, there is a good enough distance before the next traffic light junction, right? So that is why we advise, okay, we look at it and we assess it that there is a good chance of having this approved by LTA and we will let the, the uh, contractor know. So we actually have two, 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 um, uh, because um, they, due to their construction, they need two stages, two different stages. So first we have a uh, one stage crossing. It means that they can cross the road entirely in one stage at one, at one go. Just with just a little stop here, uh, not expecting them to stop, but just a, a small little thing there. And then the second stage should be, you can see, there'll be a very big area here. And we call this a two stage crossing so that they will cross one bound of the carriageway and then over here is the construction site but this would be made safe both sides and then give them a passage and they may very well have to stop over here before they can cross the next bound of, tra of the traffic. So there are many considerations right because if you want to do anything new um, especially when this is actually right smack in the uh, heartlands so we have to look at the different uh, considerations. We have to address all the different concerns that the that the residents may have. So you look at it; it's about it's longer longer walking distance, um, and then about the, for about thirty months of the construction period, um, and then there will be the why 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 actually there's a need for this because uh, there's very limited area working area for the contractor, and they need to also have a. a uh, place to store their things. So that is why they need to have this and they rather take down the pedestrian overhead bridge. And uh, also when you are constructing something, it will be very noisy and it will be very close to the, the, the uh, residence. So that means that you know, there will be noise, there's vibration uh, and uh, to either the, the private developments or to the HDB developments. And if you were not to have this if we don't take down this, this uh, so we compare whether you take down the, the POV or, or you do not take down the pedestrian overhead bridge. So what, what is it? And with that, right, the uh, residents in the area, they will have to uh, uh, bear with a longer period of uh, construction. So it becomes eight months versus like four months of, uh, so nearly half. So we weigh the benefits um, of this uh, advantages and the disadvantages. Um, moreover, even if we do not do not um, take out take off the uh, pedestrian overhead bridge, we may have to do uh, lane closures at night. So that that is why uh, uh, you know we we weigh all these, and um, of course safety is is uh, paramount for construction site. If we were to uh, leave it as it is, uh, there isn't enough uh, safe distance for the construction itself. Moreover. Um, the pedestrian overhead bridge is at that point in time not friendly to the disabled or to the elderly because there's no lift. So um, a lot of times people would actually prefer the uh, at grade crossing instead. So in order to do that, we need to do traffic, so, um, traffic analysis and part and parcel of traffic analysis, we have to take traffic counts. Now we use usually we use technology to use um, to do the traffic counts already and we do a back-end processing instead using a computer software. So, so we look at the, we also count the number of pedestrians that is using the pedestrian overhead bridge and we do junction analysis. Um, for those who are doing engineering in the audience, you may very well have heard of C-Drive analysis so that is used quite, quite uh, often to do the analysis. So this is um, these are just illustration of uh, what are the queue lines, queue lines, and uh, what is the uh, level of service. So usually, when we design, we definitely need to be at least a level of service C or D, and uh, we also make sure that the 
queues do not queue over to the next junction. So having satisfied all this, we submit to LTA and uh, LTA would then assess it and uh, decide whether or not it can be done. Anyway, so, so finally, if you, it has is, it is now been taken down and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's at grade crossing currently on site if you were to go there now. All right. So these are ways that we can, uh, transportation engineer helps uh, the contractor uh, to facilitate the construction. So the last case study that I'm going to look at is the uh, um, project safety review. So this is, um, what, is, what is project safety review? So it's actually a proactive way of uh, looking at the, of reviewing the project. So there are many stages of uh, project safety review. Um, it is actually more commonly called road safety audit in the international scene, but in Singapore, LTA calls it the project safety review, all right? And there are many, many uh, different stages. So you can look at it from the design stage, from a conceptual stage to preliminary stage to detailed design, all the way to implementation. So, and, uh, and in between that, there's also uh, existing, uh, sorry, uh, the, the traffic control plans, uh, uh, traffic diversion plans uh, uh, review as well. So, um, so this one is actually a new build uh, after construction. We also do for, for the development itself because it's a bus interchange. So it's a, uh, besides just a bus interchange, it can be also on the road itself. So this is uh, for, for, for the bus interchange. So we emphasize more on uh, the, bar, uh, the pedestrian crossing and the cycling of how they go through how, how they will actually go in and out of the uh, interchange itself. And some of them is that there's a crossing, for example, there's a crossing over here. So this is the actual picture. And this one, right, there's a crossing. And this is this over here. That's the bus interchange, uh, ingress and egress. Mm, I'm not sure whether you can see my arrow, but I will use this. So this is the ingress and egress of the bus interchange and this is the, the crossing and because it's a bus interchange ingress ingress it's actually quite large so nearly like 12 meters or so uh, and people may not be able to cross all at one go so they may need to uh, wait for the next cycle that is why we we propose to have a refuge island so at least if they can't finish crossing instead of dashing across they could at least wait on the refuge island. So this is done after, after, after the construction. And because we actually go down to the site to audit or to review, we noticed that there were a lot of uh, pedestrians and cyclists, especially cyclists, they like to just dash across. Of course, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, the rule is that you should dismount before you cross, but for practical reasons, I believe that a lot of cyclists, those who can cycle, it's, it's quite troublesome to mount and dismount and then they'll just cycle across. Um, so at least if you have something here, a railing here to those kind of railing where you can have two, two sides that is friendly to the cyclists, that at least that will slow them down and they will not dash across. So that is for their own cyclist safety, because as a cyclist, sometimes you, you think that, um, uh, you can cross, but from the driver's perspective, we can't actually see the see you, see the cyclist because it's too fast a speed. Walking speed and cycling speed is different, so it, it's quite different when you when you cycle or you walk across. When you're walking across, it's actually easier um, um, for us to see as a driver, but while you cycle, it's actually too fast. So that is why uh, in, there was this thing called the this now, but the uh, if you slow down at least before you stop and you cross, that is actually better. All right, so that's it from me. That's just a few illustration of uh, what can be done uh, for transportation planning. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm open to any questions if uh, you're still all awake.
Okay, uh, if you have any question, please feel free to unmute yourself so you can ask questions. Okay, so maybe I can ask the first question. Uh, so Emily, thank you very much for your enlightening talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so we also offer uh, like traffic engineering and traffic uh, transportation planning module in our uh, curriculum. So it's great to see uh, the application of the knowledge in those real exciting real life projects. So uh, I guess I can ask the first question. Uh, so uh, when you, you have been working in this industry uh, for many years, so uh, what will be the biggest challenge in transportation planning at this moment. So I guess all the students can learn uh, what, what is your uh, insights and suggestions. If I may be very candid, I think the biggest, biggest problem are the people. <laughs> yeah, because I believe that any technical issue can be solved, right? So, and we are able to resolve a lot of the technical issues, but um, transportation, Planning and engineering is both an art and a science because you have to balance both the uh, human factor of it as well as the technical factor. So you may have a very, very good technical solution, but sometimes you may, it's not so good for the uh, overall itself. So, so you have to weigh and you have to balance and, and uh, sometimes politics also comes into play. It's not so easy because uh, uh, we have to do quite a lot of PR work as well, right? So we, that is why I term it win-win solutions. Why? Because sometimes you have to give, give, you basically have to give and take when you are doing, uh, when you're coming up with the solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree with you. So the yes. most challenging part is to do with people and human behavior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm. So any questions? So we can go ahead and take some uh, time for questions. Okay. okay. Uh, so maybe uh, I can ask another question. So uh, because all the attendees are our students, they are undergraduate and graduate students, some of uh, our alumni, so uh, maybe uh, you can share with our student what is your suggestions for developing their uh, career path as an engineer. Mm, okay. Do you have sure. any suggestion or comments for them? Yeah. Uh, so I believe they're all civil engineering here or, or, or are they from other disciplines? Um, I think most of them are from civil. Uh, okay. So, um, well, I am def I mean, my view is definitely not in the mainstream of civil engineering. Um, in fact, it's always quite a forgotten view. Um, but I actually, I actually come from NUS. I took the civil engineering course itself. And later on, I went to specialize in the transportation. I took a master's in, a, in the UK doing transportation planning and engineering. Um, then, so I'm quite different in a sense because not many people are so willing to, as a, if you're a civil engineering graduate, you're not so willing to go directly into a specialty. Um, but I think that um, to me, I like it because to me, there were only two paths for me. I, I didn't quite like the hardcore civil engineering. So it's, it's a very personal uh, taste in that sense. Um, you, I'd rather go to do something uh, a bit more specialized. So why I pick transportation is because it's it's um I, I like the art of it. You know, it's it's uh, more than just engineering, and it's it's very intuitive. It needs a lot of you know, common sense in it in that sense. So I, I like it that way, and uh, it allows me to to be able to expand my artistic side of uh, things as well besides just the uh, engineering part, so besides just the technical part of it, yeah. So um, it's quite a personal choice, uh, but uh, there is a lot of work here. 
uh, as you can see, I mean, I came, I actually did, I actually started work in the UK, but then I came over to, came back to Singapore to start the company. And I've survived 23 years, uh, and now I have a team of people, uh, and, uh, and uh, some of the interns are here with me as well in the, in the office. And uh, yeah, so um, it will be quite interesting. There is a lot of development. You can uh, become, a, of course, transport engineering. After that, of course, we are all consultants. You, um, and there are different fields of it. There's the, uh, as I, as I, that's why I picked the different projects to give you a flavor of the different fields of uh, mm. transportation. Yeah, from modeling all the way to reviews to audits or, or you can also become a professional engineer. I'm a professional engineer, so I can actually uh, endorse the, as a qualified person, I can endorse the uh, traffic diversion plans or permanent plans itself. Thank you very much for your valuable suggestions. I saw many questions in, but maybe we can go through the questions. Uh, so we get one question from Wei Ling uh, asking how to join a WeMe Ah, that's good. Um, I can give you, yes, you go to www.awics.org.sg or you just Google Association of Women in Construction. Um, let, let me see you at that and I'll give you, I'll give you the link in the chat box in a bit. Yeah, and you can join. In fact, we have, we have ordinary members, meaning that individual, if you're already working and if you're a student, it's actually very much cheaper to join. I, cannot recall exactly, but it's only a, um, individual members is $50 and student members is actually uh, lower than uh, $50 to join. And uh, we organize activities and the next activity that we are going to have, right, would be a uh, International Women's, Women's Day event happening on the 15th of March. We will have that and um, one of the MPs, uh, Sun Xieling, she will be our guest of honor and it'll be an online Zoom session. So, um, oops, I have actually, okay, right here. This is, the, this is the link that you can go to. And if anything, you can just uh, contact me if you need to, and we can give you the forms to fill up as well, All right? Thank you for your interest of uh, joining. Okay, great. So the link has been sent out in the chat box. And uh, there's a, another question from Clarence. Uh, so he's asking uh, a, a bit more elaboration on the thought process behind win-win solutions. In the case for capture screen project, uh, part of the solution was to expand daily straight which would likely be a green space. In this case, what was considered to make that win-win solution? Yeah. Well, um, in order to, uh, or rather, okay, the idea of having it pedestrianized was, was kind of like uh, mooted by the authorities, by the URA as part and parcel of the entire planning, master planning area. And of course, at one stage, probably they wanted to pedestrianize even more of the area. But by so doing, right, you would actually cut off a uh, certain, uh, you cut off the accessibility, the vehicular accessibility to the development. So when, when this happens, it is not beneficial to the developer because uh, we are still quite a car oriented society in a sense and this is going to be a a great sort of office and uh, in the city you would expect that um, people would still want to come by car and accessibility to uh, a great uh, offices are very or by, by vehicle is very uh, very sought after in that sense so we had to uh, come up with a, well, that's why in the end, you only see half of the, of the uh, uh, street being, being uh, uh, pedestrianized. 
we could very very well have pedestrianized the whole thing although there is a excess on the other side but we could um at one stage we wanted they wanted to pedestrianize all the way to where the excess point is so then we have to weigh it and uh in that sense uh, uh negotiate on behalf of lta uh, on behalf of the developer with lta uh, which what we can do and what we cannot do so if because we are actually engaged by the consultant so of course we have to act for the consultant as well yeah. so these are some of the things thank you Lord. Uh, there are another question uh, from Hong Ling asking EIA is not just to be done by independent party. Should TIA be also constructed the same manner? Mm. Um, TIA has always been done by an independent party. Uh, that is why we come into the picture. So uh, for all the projects, we are usually engaged by the uh, owners or the developers or the, uh, basically the project team itself. And it's just so happened that we, uh, we, are like, we are like the in-between then between our client and the authority. So we have to weigh both the client and the authority's uh, uh, demands in that sense, or their wants and the, or, or what they want. And we try to be the in-between man and, and have this win-win solution that satisfy as much as possible, both parties. That's why we have to give and take in that sense, yeah, for all the solutions. So we do advise our client uh, sometimes to accept what LTA uh, dictates to us. Uh, but of course, it has to be within reasonable grounds and uh, uh, beneficial to both sides, both the authority as well as the uh, developer. Uh, Chung Pyu is asking uh, how many traffic consultants in Singapore? Sorry? I, I think the question is asking about maybe consultant company. Uh, oh, how, how many are there in Singapore? There are actually not many, uh, probably just a handful of us. Uh, um, so we are probably one of the bigger ones, uh, independent ones, uh, because many of them are tied together with um, big uh, consultants like SJ uh, or ARA. You know? So they are tied together with the big multidisciplinary consultants. So for us, we choose to be uh, independent, meaning that uh, no other, we are only doing traffic and traffic, traffic and transportation, and that's it. No other discipline. Yeah. So not that many of us, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We're probably the longest lasting one uh, in, in Singapore and uh, the, you can say the, the, the truly local one. Okay, yeah, the company has 20 years here. Yeah. Okay, so it seems we have covered all the questions. Mm. Uh, so Ms. Chen, do you have anything in your mind you would like to cover before we wrap up? No, I think, um, yeah, nothing very much. Just uh, thank you all for coming and listening to me and staying all the way to the end. Uh, yeah, uh, hope that uh, everybody enjoyed the talk and that um, you're encouraged to come into transportation engineering. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, you uh, Ms. Chen, for uh, giving this uh, insightful talk. And uh, thank you very much for your suggestions for our students. I think we all learn a lot. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to maybe text 10 offline. Any further questions, especially um, how to join the association. Uh, so also thank everyone for being with us today. Uh, so before we end the session today, I'd like to invite uh, all of you to uh, join the NUS Engineering Open House on March 1st. Uh, so our staff will send out the link and information if you'd like to hear our professor and student to talk about life in uh, NUS in Engineering School. Please do come to join us on March 1st. Okay, another question. Someone asked if the present.
presentation can share. So I guess it's asking the video or the slides. So our video, will it be uploaded to the YouTube? A slides. So I think someone is asking whether the slides can be shared. Okay, yeah, I think we can share the slides. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you very much, Miss Chen. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. All right, bye.